Hathor. The deity that we know as Hathor is one of the most complex and interesting of any deity that we see in almost any pantheon. I say this with great reverence as Hathor is, is personally my patron, so goddess I've tried to become very familiar with over the years. To start off this explanation of this very, very complex and important character, we're going to talk about where she comes from first. So again, as we've been on this theme of talking about deities from uh, Canis Major, this would be her celestial origin, would be this star identified in the in what we call as what we call the Dog Star or in that planetary system. As a netter, she was associated with motherhood, but also love, beauty, sexuality, and ultimately vengeance as well. So there are two very distinct aspects to who this character is, and we're going to talk about both of them independently. Period of worship was from approximately the Old Kingdom, and her worship actively continued until about the end of Kemetic history with the invasion of Earth, the Persian army, and then later the Greek, and of course, uh, successions of other conquerors or invaders. She is known as the Eye of Ra, she is known as the mother goddess. She is known as Sekhmet, the lion goddess. And we'll talk about Sekhmet and, that, and the significance of that role um, for this particular Netter, who makes her a little different than some of the other Netter representations that we've seen. What we know about Sekhmet is in her first role, she is considered to be, uh, or she's, she represents the cow, which is in this, in this civilization was a sacred animal as cows were held in very high esteem. Her father is the sun god Ray, and she is often described as the mother of all comedic pharaohs that will follow. And in fact, at many segments throughout this history, the pharaoh is known as the son of Hathor. Now this was a deity who had many, many cult centers, a couple of major cult centers in Dendera and also Giza and Thebes. So she was an extremely popular goddess. She was probably one of the more popular deities that we would see um, coming out of this belief system during that period of time. She's also shown in many art references as well. Major art, art references, obviously, at the Sanctuary and Dendera. There are sculptures and compositions for her um, at the Temple of Giza. Then also there are reliefs at the Temple of Queen Hapsetput at, at Thebes. And there are many, many other contemporary sculptures and paintings dedicated to the Netter that we would call Hathor. Now, while we know her as... The Eye of Ra. This is a protective role. So with Hathor, we get a lot of division. So first, we're going to talk about her representation of the, of the cow. And in that representation, she is more of a mother goddess. She's a giver. But she also has this role as Sekhmet and the Eye of Ra, where she is a protector and defender. And even, be go, even goes beyond that just normal protection into a bloodlust. And that, it comes out of that sac that second identity of her. So first we look at her as the sacred cow. And this is at a time where you know the, the concept of the cow being a sacred animal is deeply rooted in a lot of other uh, belief systems and philosophies. Obviously, we can point to Hinduism right off the bat where cows are thought to be sacred and are deeply respected. They are held in high esteem and ultimately worshipped. And they are seen as caregivers or maternal figures. And that mimics Hathor's representation of a mother goddess. We saw in Hinduism their creative, their creator deity often being shown as a cow, and they respected their gentle nature, but also their strength. But we see other religions, Jainism, Buddhism, and Zoroastrianism, also believe that the cow was a sacred animal and held the cow in that regard. So an interesting concept that we see. Now these are all uh, cultures that we could kind of see connections to. But even further than that, we can see in Scandinavian mythology, it was the udder of the cow of creation that flowed to form the four primordial rivers that nourish the eldest races of beings. And we even see it carried out further beyond Scandinavian, but also we see it in Etruscan society, and that came out in their deity that they call Lat. Now, these of course being the, the progenitors of the Latin people, the representation of Lat or this 
uh, milk giver deity was reflected in the Greeks and she was called Latonia, Leto or Leda. And Europeans also worshipped a moon cow who was ultimately mated with the white bull which was a representation of their deity called Zeus. Celtic mythology held the belief of a sacred cow uh, deity that was Demona. Even in the Visigoth culture, the oxen was a representation of strength that was shown throughout the mythology. So I just wanted to show that we have a continuity of that respect for cows beyond what comedic, perhaps influenced by comedic. So that was her initial role of this mother goddess. And she felt she held a very special role. Again, she was seen as the mother of all the pharaohs that were to come. She had a strong uh, connection to the deity that we would call Heru, who was ultimately Avenger. So that was one aspect of Hathor. And in that personality, she's always represented as uh, a cow or a woman with cow features, a cow's head, or even when she had uh, more human features, she still would have the ears of a cow. Something that always tied her to that representation. But being that she was a goddess of love and beauty, this was a cow that was a beautiful cow. And this cow was adorned with the things that we know are Netzer Hathor likes. She likes gold, she likes silver, she likes jewelry. So these are things that we can use to appease the Netzer that we would call Hathor. But Hathor also has a secondary personality, which is just as impactful as her representation. This was as Sekhmet, and Sekhmet was one of the lion goddesses or a cat-headed goddess. And we see many representations. I've done a video about cat-headed, uh, and Hathor stood out among those as being one of the most powerful of the lion-headed deities. And this is a time, obviously, uh, during the age of Leo, so the representation of the lion was extremely significant to these people at this time. So Hathor in this role of the Eye of Ra, and I will do a separate video specifically about the Eye of Ra, was a protector. And being a protector of Ra, who was always under attack, was ultimately being a protector of all mankind. If Ra were to fall, you know, literally the sun did not shine again, that is the end of life for all of us. So she was a protector of that. And, and an interesting story about the figure Sekhmet, at some point, the myth tells us that Ra became disillusioned with humans and that they weren't praying and their offerings weren't good enough. So he unleashes Hathor, or excuse me, he unleashes Sekhmet upon the populace of humans. And Sekhmet goes down and starts to bring vengeance to these humans of Earth for their disrespect to her father, who was the ultimate deity and the symbol of life for this cosmology. And she began to slay humans in this powerful role of this goddess who was part lion and had this representation of a deity combined with this animal instincts and she slew by the thousands. And Sekhmet gained a bloodlust and she fell in love with the idea of killing and the taste of blood and nothing could satiate her. And after a time the other netters came to Ra and asked that he show mercy and when he went to Hathor to stop her rage he found that even his power could not stay her hand and she continued to slay. Ultimately Ra came up with a ruse to stop her because he couldn't even stop her power. This is what this goddess was in her rage. So the Netter known as Tenen who happened to be deified as a goddess of beer made a very powerful brew of beer that they dyed red and they poured this beer over the land in the area where Hathor was doing her killing and in her bloodlust she drank it thinking that this is more blood and she becomes drunken and she falls asleep passes out and when she arises the next day she arises again as Hathor and the segment personification of her has been satiated so this is a significant this is a significant story for a lot of different reasons. One, we're seeing an entirely different side of Hathor in this role of Sekhmet. She's gone from being the mothering goddess to this ultimate killer. Less of a representation of a mother deity and more a representation of this goddess of beauty and love and sexuality. So we see a shift. So Hathor in many ways in, in, in enjoys three kind of specific 
uh, relationships with mankind in her role as a mother, in her role as a death dealer, and then in her role as this beautiful goddess of love. Few deities can say that they had that type of rela relationship or that type of longevity. The important thing about this particular story, it fits the archetype of other god destruction stories, if we look at this as a metaphor. So we remember what we learned studying the Sumerian mythology, and at some point Inki or Enlil become so upset with humans, I believe it was the noise of humans, that they unleash plagues. I mean, they do it multiple times. And in, in, in Sumerian mythology, we believe it to be plagues, we believe it to be floods, which of course is significant, as this ties into other belief systems. So these two stories were idea, and this would also obviously be reflected in uh, Abrahamic belief systems, at least in terms of uh, this in, in terms of the flood being the cause. But we see this deity who sits at the top, whether you were looking at it from the perspective of the Sumerian or the Kemetic or the Abrahamic, that this deity who sits at the top decides at some point to unleash a plague or a pestilence or a flood on mankind as vengeance. So we see something very consistent. And that's one of those points that that for nine world chronicles is significant that we'll have to come back to and why do we continue to see this representation about the god becoming angry and unleashing the plague so this is in a nutshell is who hathor is this massively complex deity who has shown strength and tenderness and kindness but also brutal savagery that we have not seen from any other deity in the comet pantheon she was different than nephthys and Aset. Singularly because if you look at the story of Aset, who was this powerful goddess who had a great loss. She lost her husband. She had to fear for her son. She had to go on the run. They had to fight this war against her brother Set. And if we look at the beautiful, powerful Netra, who we call Nephthys, who guides us through the underworld, she was ultimately rejected by her husband. I mean, this is this is a Netra of ultimate beauty, ultimate power. She was rejected by her consort who was set, she proved herself to be a loyal asset and friend to her sister. She was a great mother to her son Anpu and she was a great aunt to her nephew Hera. So we see a lot of complexities, ups and downs for these deep loss. But not for Hathor. Hathor never knows loss. Hathor never knows defeat. She in the end to me is ultimate confidence. And as she's, as she's the mother of the Pharaoh, it seems appropriate because she's feeding into them this energy that comes from her. She is the ultimate warrior. She's the ultimate mother. She is the ultimate uh, deity. She had temples and centers built to her throughout the ancient world. And her influence has remained strong to this day. She is ultimately the symbol of the cow. The cow goddess who is still held in high regard at many cultures throughout the world. From Hinduism to Jainism to Zoroastrianism, people still believe in the idea and the concept of the sacred cow. So it is with this reverence that again I come and present this work as a piece on our goddess Hathor, our Netter Hathor, and hope that this sparks conversations about who this Netter was, what she represented, and what her impact ultimately was. You can find more information on all these topics on our website at NineWorldChronicles.com. Thank you for being part of our discussion. Please be sure to like and subscribe.